Good morning from Costa Rica. Thanks for joining us both in person and online. This next In Conversation segment is led by Brett Solomon, Executive Director of Access Now, and he'll be speaking with Doreen Bogdan Martin, Secretary General of the International Telecommunication Union. At the ITU, she has pushed for digital applications to promote economies, jobs, and social economic inclusion. She also thinks about how connectivity can promote gender equality and how it can combat climate change. Enjoy the conversation. Hi, Doreen. Um, welcome to RightsCon. It's so great to have you here. You're actually the first ITU Secretary General that we've hosted um, at RightsCon, so thank you for joining us. Thank you. Happy to be here, Brett. Thank you. Um, and congratulations also on perhaps not such, such a new position now, but um, your appointment as Secretary General. Um, can you give us a sense of, you know, your first 100 days, what you've learned, how's that informing your approach to this role? Um, sure. Thank you. Um, so my first 100 days, which uh, I would say sort of flew by, uh, <laughs> were laser focused on trying to build a fit for future ITU. Um, I think, as you well know, um, our mission and mandate to connect the world, even though we're 158 years old, has never uh, been more important. So I really spent those first 100 days focusing on um, how to achieve an institution that inspires, that includes, and that, um, that innovates. So lots of internal focus on trying to understand where we are, where are the gaps, how can we achieve an institution of excellence, and of course, at the same time, focusing externally, uh, focusing on strengthening our strategic engagements uh, with UN partners, with civil society, academia, governments, private sector, um, and trying to make sure that the voice of the ITU is uh, is heard, and as you know, digital issues are topping agendas everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> everywhere, including, of course, at the UN system. So uh, I yeah. think it's important that, um, that the ITU uh, and our mandate is clearly understood and, and identified. Yeah. One of the issues that you mentioned there is about connectivity, and thanks a lot for that. Um, I always love the ITU's, like, our ability to be able to access a lot of the data from the ITU. And one of the statistics that we have is that, not such a happy one, I guess, is that 2.7 billion people, give or take, are not on the internet, are not connected. And even worse um, is that the majority of those people are actually women and girls. I know that this is a pet issue or an important issue for you personally. And I'd like to get a sense from you, um, what, do you what do you think are the reasons for this? I mean, are we just sort of replicating patriarchy in the online environment? And what is preventing us from ensuring that we really do have meaningful connectivity for all of us? Yeah, thank you. Um, it's a great question. And uh, I'm happy you mentioned meaningful because at the end, that's what it's all about. It's not just the connection. It's what you can do with, uh, with the connection. Uh, and when we look at the numbers, the 2.7 billion people that have never, ever accessed the Internet, and as you said, the majority being uh, women and, and, and girls, I think there's, there's sort of no silver bullet to extending connectivity and to tackling the, the, the digital divide. Um, mm -hmm. It's a combination of factors. Uh, of course, it's, it's the affordability issue. It's the cost uh, in many ways, it's, uh, it's too expensive, in particular uh, for the world's poorest. Uh, there's a big literacy component, digital literacy, digital skills that prevents women and girls uh, from being able to benefit from their connectivity. Uh, there's also safety issues, um, which we saw during the pandemic. Uh, online bullying and harassment of women and girls increased. Uh, and so in some cases, women and girls are actually afraid to go online. Um, of course, there's content issues. Is the content relevant? Uh, is it available in local languages? So those are the kinds of, of issues that, that we see. I think the good news, um, if there is good news on this issue, is that um, the UN Commission on the Status of Women actually focused on this issue this year. That was the theme yeah. for you. Yeah, um, and I think we did get some, some good conclusions on the importance of, of finance 
uh, for inclusion, uh, digital inclusion, uh, to also zooming in on, uh, on the policies, uh, having gender responsive uh, policies, making sure that um, technology design, development and deployment are also uh, gender responsive. So I think that helps. Um, but when, you know, when I look at I, I, I was just going to say, when I look at the work that the ITU has done, we've been focused on this. It was 25 years ago this year uh, that we actually um, had our first resolution uh, at a conference on gender. And I think we've made some progress, including women's participation in, in the sector, but I don't think we can celebrate it. I think we have to do much more to make um to make targeted interventions to close the digital gender gap. Yeah, thank you. And I think many civil society groups have been focused on this issue for a long time, for 25 years or more. Um, but, um, you know, it sort of feels like it's an extra special problem, right? It takes extra special analysis and, and niche responses. Um, and, and as I say, a long way to go. I mean, 2.7 billion people is just like an unfathomable amount, given the fact that technology now has become such an inherent part, as you say at the beginning, in everything and everybody's lives, which makes it all the more curious why governments um, are at times shutting off the internet. And, you know, you at the ITU and you yourself, uh, Secretary General, have talked about how the internet is so essential as a life-saving um, um, platform, particularly in times of crisis. You know, we saw 187 internet shutdowns in 35 countries last year. Access Now um, runs the Keep It On Coalition, which has about 300 NGOs in it. Um, so, but we're increasingly seeing connectivity issues, intentional disruptions of the network at times of crisis. So how do we deliver or maybe how do you deliver a message um, from the ITU that internet access is actually a humanitarian issue now? It's a saving life issue, particularly in times of crisis. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, internet access does save lives. Um, and I think the internet is a uniquely powerful enabler um, for the sustainable development goals and um, wow. as you and of course, for, for human rights. Um, you know, I think when we look back, and Brett, you'll remember the World Summit on the Information Society, it was pretty clear even back in 2003 as part of the outcome document where world leaders came together um, that, that the WISIS principles to bring an information society for all um, uphold the principles of, um, of the Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights. Um, we need to we need to think about that. We need to keep that uh, at the core. Um, our approach is grounded in human rights, and the ITU urges every country to provide its citizens with as broad an access uh, to the means of communications as possible. I think that's in line with the International Covenant on on Civil and Political Rights, uh, the ICCPR, and of course the ITU Constitution. Um, it does um, carry, let's say, specific duties and responsibilities, such as the respect of the rights or reputations of others and protection of national security or of public order uh, as are provided by law and, of course, as are, as are necessary. Uh, we continue to advocate for digital connectivity and Internet access uh, for all people everywhere, regardless of, of their means. Uh, we think it's critical that all voices are heard, that all voices are respected. And again, we also see this as core to the achievement of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And when yeah. it comes to times of crisis, uh, we've seen a number of um, natural, unfortunate natural disasters, and we know how important access to communications, early warning systems can actually save lives, as you mentioned in the beginning. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's this again is another kind of vexing problem that we are still trying to solve through, as you know, as a result of civil society's work on it, but also institutions like the ITU is that the issue of um, connectivity, um, particularly when there's humanitarian crises at play, means that it's not just humanitarian human rights law that needs to apply; it's also international humanitarian law, um, and we've seen the consequences. Of course, with natural disasters, um, as you say, but also 
when we have man-made crises like we're seeing in Ukraine, for instance, where you know there's been intentional blowing up of and destruction of infrastructure, um, which of course um, I'm, I know is of concern to the ITU, um, not just in that country but in, in others. Um, you mentioned the SDGs and thanks a lot, the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, I think when they were passed, it felt like 2030 was a, lo a long way away. <laughs> um, it's not, right? I mean, it's just around the corner. And, and one of those uh, SDGs is about environmental sustainability and climate. And there seems to be, you know, sometimes the SDGs are kind of in not in conflict with each other, but there's tension. So we're calling for connectivity for everybody, meaningful connectivity. But that means like, you know, new devices, it needs billions of new devices and also old devices are ending up in landfill. Also means there's further pressure on, um, you know, on data centres, which means more crea creation of carbon. And I, I'm wondering, like, how do you, how do you kind of reconcile that? Um, at RightsCon this year, there's a particular focus on uh, climate, the climate crisis, bringing the power of the digital rights movement to the climate crisis. Um, so I'm really interested in your perspective on this. Well, I love this question because I think it, it reflects the ITU's entire strategy for the next four years. Um, when, uh, when we had our last plenipotentiary conference last year, the member states gave us a twofold mandate, uh, universal connectivity and sustainable digital transformation. And of course, in terms of this question, emphasis on, on the sustainable piece, um, when we look at the, the connectivity piece that, that we discussed previously, you know, we have a, an understanding of what needs to be done, uh, the investment challenges that, uh, that are presented, and we've put together something that you have followed closely, which is our partner to connect uh, digital, digital coalition. And when it comes to the sustainable digital transformation piece, um, I would say I'm encouraged because our membership uh, is very focused on the sustainability piece. Uh, we've been working on um, science-based targets and technical standards, uh, looking at green uh, digital uh, and ways that we can work with our sector to actually reduce um, our sector's uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the e-waste piece is a huge one, in particular for developing countries. Uh, so we've been working with, um, I would say all countries, but in particular developing countries to help them put in place um, e-waste policies, e-waste management um, facilities uh, so that they can develop this circular economy, which um, which we think is, is so necessary. Um, you, you mentioned the focus at RightsCon um, that, that you will be taking on this issue. Uh, we will also be having a much more active presence and participation at COP28. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's critical that we focus on green digital. Um, yeah. So we're looking forward to working with you and other partners to uh, make a strong showing and a strong case at COP28 of what our sector can do um, to, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Mm, that's excellent. And I look forward to working with you on that. There's so many points of intersection with okay. climate and technology now. And I think many governments are kind of, I don't know, talking about technology as the, as the answer or a large part of the answer. I think we need to be a little skeptical of that as well. We need to think about, you know, about reduction really of, of carbon emissions, uh, about keeping fossil fuels in the ground, not necessarily about, you know, technology driven sequestration. Um, but I'm really glad to hear that you'll be, um, there'll be a strong showing of the ITU um, at, at COP28, which is the climate change conference, the UN climate change conference. Um, we also, um, we've been involved in, 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 um, in COP for a few years now because we've been, also focused on the fact that environmental defenders and climate change actors are often also at risk from their online activities. And so we see on the helpline, I think it's about 15% of cases that come through our helpline are individuals who are trying to protect their land, their forests, um, responding to mining companies, et cetera, under technical attack, which is a whole nother thing that we'd never really thought of. Um, I wanted to, um, I know we've got limited time and there's so many, uh, there's a couple more questions I'd like to ask you. One is about, um, um, is about satellite internet. 
Um, and I think many of us have started now, or many of us have been working on this for a number of years, but it's really now in the popular kind of um, zeitgeist that um, that satellite internet is available and is also very, really quite accessible. Uh, of course, there's the risk of um, satellites, you know, crashing <laughs> in, in space. Uh, and I know that your th the, the ITU has been involved in this, um, not the crashing, but they're trying to avoid <laughs> the crash uh, between between some of the the satellites. Give me a sense of like some of your um, your early thinking on low Earth orbit satellites for communication and how different stakeholders are can and are participating in that effort. Um, yeah, I think it's it's an exciting time for for space and for the satellite industry as a. As a whole, um, you know, I think with this, um, with these new, the sort of new fleets of, of Leo satellite systems, I think it offers tremendous opportunities to connect the unconnected. Of course, at the end, there will always be a blend of, of technologies from, um, you know, terrestrial wireless uh, satellite. Um, but I think, I think there's a lot of opportunities that we can leverage from uh, from the Leo. Um, systems. Um, I think they will be a game changer that they offer developing countries an opportunity to, to connect quickly, um, mm. to, well, to scale up connectivity internally, also across, across borders. Uh, we're trying to leverage um, some of uh, the new excitement in, in space in the context of our school connectivity program that we're, we're mm. advancing with UNICEF, our, our giga effort to connect every school in the world to the internet. Um, but as you, as you mentioned, I mean, there's, there's lots of issues to be considered uh, in, uh, in the exciting things happening in, uh, in space. ITU has been involved in space for Many many years, uh, as we are responsible not just for the uh, the satellite orbital uh, positioning, but also the allocation of um, the communications related frequencies to uh, to those satellites. Um, mm -hmm. So we're looking at um, at a number of issues. We have a new uh, resolution on space 2030, um, looking at sustainability issues. Um, I know there's a lot of discussion on space debris, space traffic management. Um, we're working with, uh, with UNOSA uh, in the UN system as the UN Secretary General is also quite focused on this issue and has called for, uh, for a space dialogue in the context of um, next year's Summit of the Futures. So mm. we're excited. We know there's a lot of issues, but I think there are also many opportunities. Can I just ask you a side question on that in relation to how you at the ITU are managing the private sector or how the relationship with the private sector has evolved now that the private sector is so, uh, has invested so heavily in satellites um, at, at the LEO level? Yeah. Um, well, as you know, ITU has um, an interesting membership composition. I think it makes us quite unique. We have our 193 member states, but we also have uh, well over 800 private sector members, many of which are the uh, the satellite operators or those engaged in the satellite industry? So we work with them directly on uh, a number of initiatives. Many of them have made specific commitments in the context of our partner to connect pledging platform. But when it comes to things like filings, for example, mm. satellite filings. Um, because of our radio regulations and our other procedures, go through a member state. So, um, of course, we'll always have um, member state engagement, uh, but we're very happy that we're working, I would say, with the majority of, uh, mm. of space players. Mm. And as you, when you talk about membership, I think it's also good to think about the evolution of the ITU as well in terms of its relationship with civil society and how, you know, access can be gained to some of the information that's, generally, you know, sort of part of the ITU discussions for members and for some of the companies as delegates, but also expanding that as broadly as possible to civil society. And, you know, we've, we've talked about that in the past. I have one last question for you, which is about, of course, generative AI, obviously the topic of the du jour. Um, and um, I wanted to ask you, I mean, you've seen in your tenure at the ITU 
an evolution of technologies and obviously the ITU since 1865 has seen technologies come and go. Um, I know that there's a, a, um, a focus from the ITU on some of the, the positives through, you know, your AI for Good initiative and the Global Summit that's coming up on some of the things that we've talked about, like climate crisis and bolstering humanitarian response. But, I'm, but we're also hearing a lot on the doomsday scenarios as well. And I'm just interested in your own personal thoughts about this moment in time. Like how big a deal is this? How significant is it? How important is it not just for the people who are assembled at RightsCon but for the entire global community to be engaged with this? I'm really interested in to hear what you, what you think. Yeah, um, I mean, it is, it's, it, it's a big deal. Um, and, and, and you know that. Um, and I think there are tremendous opportunities if we get it right. Um, but there are also big challenges and risks if we, if we get it wrong. And, you know, as you know, I mean, from, from the G7 to the G20 to the UN, um, not a single forum goes by without having at least someone address um, generative AI and, um, you know, the need to do something. Um, of course, next year in the context of the Summit of the Futures, um, there is this piece of the Global Digital Compact that's focused on AI. Um, but I guess, can we wait until then? Um, things are moving so quickly. Uh, we do have our um, AI for Good Summit, as you alluded to. It comes up in July, back in person for the first time. Uh, and we will have many governments, some 40 UN agencies, and we will have discussions because I think at this point, we need to, we need to keep talking. We need to keep engaging with the right stakeholders to find out what we can together do um, to ensure that the benefits um, of, uh, of generative AI can be, can, 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 can flourish and that we can mitigate uh, potential risks and ensure that this is uh, developed in a, in a responsible manner. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, it just poses challenges for all of us. And I was thinking actually, as I was listening to you about the challenges that it poses to global governance institutions, uh, and and what the response needs to be, and you've seen obviously calls for pauses uh, in terms of large language model deployment and development, um, um, and you also of course raise the issue of like the speed with which not just the scope but the speed with which we need to respond. I think there's many many sessions, maybe twenty or thirty sessions here at RightsCon uh, on AI, so we'll be sure to deliver you some of our thoughts and some of the thoughts from some of the experts who are present. Um, yeah, which maybe can feed into your AI for Good Summit in July. Can I can I just add something, Brett? You know, when we think about what's happening in the AI space and um, the opportunities, the challenges, I always think it's important to balance it with the fact that 2.7 billion people have never ever connected, um, and and the the implications of furthering the divide. So as we address these issues and challenges around emerging and new tech, at the same time, we have to be faster on connecting the unconnected because otherwise we just, yeah. the divide's bigger and harder yeah. to close. Yeah. And let me just re respond to that as well, because um, it is true that, you know, we have these 2.7 billion people who are disconnected, but not only are they, not, are they disconnected, they also don't have a say in the technologies that are being developed at the other end of the spectrum and yet will probably be impacted the most. Mm -hmm. um, and we think about, you know, government and also corporate investment, which end of the spectrum are we investing in and making sure that we bring up that group of, <clears throat> of folks, the marginalised, the dispossessed, the, you know, the migrants, asylum seekers, you name it, Indigenous folks, women um, who aren't able to even enter the digital sphere yet. Um, mm -hmm. Before we start, but again, you know, like, I mean, that's a hope. I don't think we can even think about it now in terms of we need to respond in real time. And, and so thank you very much for being with us. Thanks for your time. We look forward to, I know that there are a number of representatives from the ITU who are at RightsCon, which is great. So people should look out for them. And thank you for very much for your time. 
Thank you. Thank you, Brett. A pleasure. Thanks.